Hello, uh, welcome to NFX Crash Course video number one. Uh, I'm gonna be giving a series of uh, short videos covering the NFX Unistack framework. Uh, the purpose of this is to uh, get people on boarded on the project so I don't have to repeat this 25,000 times. Instead, you guys can watch the series of these videos and compile the question list and give it to me, and then I can address those. Uh, but the majority of topics and questions are going to be answered here today. So first of all, um, let's start from, from the GitHub uh, repository, NFX, OM code NFX. So here we have concentrated uh, some uh, information in the form of uh, wiki pages or rather links from the wiki page. So what is Unistack? This goes to our blog. This describes what a Unistack Unified Framework stack is. And this gives a pretty good list of what NFX Framework does. Application container, quote analysis, database abstraction layer, environment configuration, uh, interprocess, uh, interprocess node configure, uh, co communication, uh, distributed, distributed programming, instrumentation, uh, uh, various you know uh, I/O functions, logging, record model, security, and web programming, and so on and so forth. So you can you can browse it here. Uh, then you can browse the code and we're introducing the new uh, guide section here that will talk about those different areas of the framework and will cover the the topics so in this series of videos I'll try to cover those uh, and we'll put more content as it comes out on the site uh, so uh, a good resource for help right now would be NFX demos project which is in the same uh, under the same repository path on code Anifax demos. So here uh, I have asked some of our developers to create a, a very simple uh, applications series of applications actually that covers some of the aspects of the framework. So this is kind of jumpstart uh, you know the development. So for example, the configuration you can. Uh, you can run this applet or application here and see how um, configuration can can be used. And there is some, some pretty good documentation here that talks what the hell is going on with configuration. Then uh, the next thing that you can probably uh, look at is going to be Wave. Wave is an acronym of our technology uh, that deals with web web application framework with view enhancements. You know that is enhanced for view rendition and stuff like that. So uh, there is a database application, a simple CRUD application. There is a hello world with MVC and no MVC, logging resources, view engines. I'm going to be talking about this in a few minutes. And um, so so this resource is great resource to jumpstart, you know, getting acquainted with uh, the technology in general. So glue is the uh, part of the framework that deals with gluing contracts and endpoints together between machines, something similar to Windows Communication Foundation. You can read about it here. Uh, and certainly this deserves way more uh, documentation, uh, uh, you know, in the future. But, but we have what we have at this point and we'll be adding stuff here. So, okay, so the primary repository is NFX Framework. So what is NFX Framework? NFX Framework is .NET Framework Extension. It's just an acronym that that uh, I started developing, uh, you know, a while back, or more than ten years ago, probably at this point. So uh, it is used in production in some projects, and even in some companies, big companies, even. Um, uh, the the whole The whole uh, idea of Unistack it is a unified stack of software. So uh, somewhere here, I have a little picture. Okay, that one of the uh, guys did in Russia when he was presenting it to uh, some other, you know, uh, people at the meetup. So this is what it used to be. Okay, so that's that's your typical, let's say, include package uh, package roster for your packages, NuGet packages for your application. And this is what it is now with NFX. Okay, you only have one package. Okay, so all of that stuff is pretty much now again. 
uh, of course you can use NFX because it's a very small library. Uh, you can use it just for some functions, but it was built, it was purposed to have a unified stack of software. So instead of all of that stuff, you have one library. So as such, NFX has to solve many, many problems and provide many services that developers need to create their applications. So first start from the very basics. The application model is the way how you organize applications in NFX. That is the application container. Now that is a very overloaded term and someone may think about dependency injection containers and, and stuff like that. The concept here is similar, although it is a way more lightweight concept. And in NFX, uh, the stress is is put on the fact of practicality okay not purism by but practicality so what i mean by saying practicality so the practical framework has to give you what is needed in most of the cases not what could have been needed in some project had this project been done this way or that way so for that purposes some things are already a part of the application. Any application, in fact, implements this interface, okay? And therefore, you have out of the box, you have instrumentation because any application needs to be instrumented. You have throttling. Uh, now, that's not a good candidate for inclusion here, but we used it somewhere, so that's why we included it here. Uh, configuration, that is where you configure your, configure your application from. We never use .NET configuration because we have very little to do with .NET at all. And I think I mentioned it in pre previous videos and told you already. So um, uh, the data store is where you take your data from. Now, if you r build a notepad application, you still need a data store in uh, NFX terms. I mean, you don't have to write it like this, obviously, but a good design would have a data store that would store text files for a notepad, and you would have functions like open file, save file, see if the file has modified and everything. So the object store is the object-oriented database that you can um, uh, survive process restarts and, and uh, store your objects bef uh, between the, um, the process uh, recycles and stuff. The glue is the technology to c connect to different nodes, different process instances on different machines, different networks, whatever. Security manager is your stuff to have roles, permissions. This is a very, very, very powerful framework in terms of security. You can go as granular as button, field, um, you know, on the UI screen, on the web screen, on the Windows forum screen, although I don't really actively support and we don't use it anywhere in WinForms development, but um, there is still, I mean, this was used for Windows programming as well, WinForms programming. Time source is a great way to synchronize your time and get your time uh, correctly, especially if you're in the cluster environment. What time is it now? I mean, do you do use daytime now or uh, we don't use it like this? If you need to log your time in the database, you take it from the time source that you can uh, inject from atomic clock and synchronize it between processes and stuff. Event timer is a scheduler, basically. You can schedule stuff, uh, events. Um, in app, in Anathax, every application has a concept of session state or rather session, I beg your pardon, not session state. The session is the session of work with the application. So let's say you build a console app, a single user console app. It still has a session. The user is working with this application. Even if it says hello world, there is a session there. So you have a session ID, a user. Now you can have an application that can only tolerate one session, or you can have a server application that can tolerate 25,000 sessions at the same time. And this is very lightweight. So it's not like session state in ASP.NET. So consequently, what this gives us is a very, uh, very unified model. Wherever you are in the component library, you can say, um, what session, what permissions, what user and whatnot, and you get some context uh, around your call, okay? Now, uh, unlike .NET or Java applications that, you know, you have a console app and there is no such thing as session, 
you don't need it, okay? So you don't have it. But if you build some more complex logic, and you sometimes need to have a concept of session, at least the context of the user, a context of the, um, uh, you know, of the of the permissions and stuff like that. Is this now? Uh, some people have asked me a question: Does this mean that the NFX is not a RESTful system? Now wait a second, RESTful that deals with web. NFX is a much wider framework. NFX web and web services is just one of the sub functions of the NFX framework. And of course, you can build stateless, sessionless web services. That does not mean that your whole web server still has a session in terms of application session with your operating system, so to speak. Okay, or you can make it as granular as every call gets a session or every user gets a session, then it is not restful. It's up to you how you implement it. What I'm saying is that session is a more general broad term and it's wider than worldwide web programming. Okay, so uh, we talked about this. We have application now. Uh, when I talked about application, I showed you some um, main services like logger, instrumentation, and stuff. If none of the services are injected, you get a NOP, no operation uh, implementation. That is, you never get a null reference. So if there is no instrumentation, let's say you built a console app and you don't need to have a, uh, a, a, a uh, an instrumentation or a logger, so someone writes to the log, nothing is gonna crash. This is just not gonna go anywhere because there is, uh, there is no particular sync or no particular logging framework connected. It's just, you know, sitting there and does not, no operation behavior. All right, so we talked about it. Now, uh, right here, you have an interest, very interesting namespace called Pile. This is a big memory model for .NET applications. Actually, it deals with storing hundreds of millions of objects in a .NET CLR heap without calling GC to stall and GC pauses. And the way how it works, it provides the, the, uh, the first interface here, IPile status, and then IPile is a pile status, and uh, it's an application component that has put you can put the CLR object and you get a pile pointer, which is a struct. A struct uh, re, um, remaps the CLR object into a segment and an address, and it is a struct, so it is a value type, not a reference type. So the way how it works depends on the pile implementation, whoever implements the pile, but you can, you can take your objects out of the CLR heap and store them e uh, either in the unmanaged heap or managed heap. So default pile implementation, the way how it does things, it uses a very, very efficient, transparent teleportation serializer. Why is it a teleporting serializer, teleportation serializer? It allows you to teleport pre pretty much anything which is marked as serializable, okay? So any classes, even like things like concurrent dictionaries and stuff like that, that can be stored in the pile. How fast is the pile? It is very fast. On this machine that has six cores on it and three gigahertz processor, 64 gigabytes of RAM, I could easily get uh, a few million transactions a second, every second, and I can store up to a billion objects uh, you know, little objects, but if you're objects like a person with like 20 fields or 15 fields, you can easily store around 600 million objects. And what's interesting is that Pile uses less memory than the native CLR object storage because it compresses uh, the space uh, by doing special adaptive um, uh, type uh, rendition in the stream. We can talk about it some other time. I have some other videos there that des describe the specifics how this works. What is this needed for? Well, this is this is a perfect solution for in-memory caching. Therefore, there is another interface right here called cache. And this thing is purpose for uh, caching lots of stuff, lots of stuff in memory, hundreds of millions of objects like social graphs and causality chains. Let's say you have an application uh, where you need to know 
who caused i mean what 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 user or what what vehicle or what order caused what other order or what car caused another crash with what other car or something like this or you need to s store streets or delivery addresses and there are very many of them in memory you can do that with this how does this compare to redis well this is a kind of a an in-memory database that allows you to bypass the process communication with redis or memcache altogether and that can store the uh the native objects so see this thing here put you it takes an object you put an object in the cache you don't put a json object you don't have to turn your object in CLR into JSON to be able to use this cache, which is very good. So the main advantage of this over what Microsoft has with memory cache is that this uses pile. It keeps the objects in the pile, not in the managed heap. So that means that you have hundreds of millions of objects and it doesn't stall your processor. It doesn't stall your process. Okay, so enough about this. The volatile is something that, uh, you know, for storage of some transient or transitive uh, state um, where you can just store it and then just restore it, survive the process, restart. If you have a session state in web farm or, I mean, in the web server, then your web server can restart and then it will bring your session, it will hydrate it from the disk or from MongoDB or wherever you want to store your stuff. So that's what this object store entry, store provider, store service, all of that stuff is here. Okay. So application model, code analysis. Code analysis is an important concept for laxers and making laxers and parsers. So currently we have uh, a little bit outdated parser for, or la rather laxer, I beg your pardon, for C Sharp, a full parser and laxer for JSON. Uh, the laconic format is the format of our configuration that we use throughout the system. So that's the most important namespace here. Stuff to work with the source, you know, taking the source for parsing from text, from named buffer, from file, from this, from that. Um, so that's pretty much it, uh, you know, lexer parser. So, um, yeah, and then the pattern search is a tokenization library that, that is basically... Uh, very useful for doing lazy like, uh, you know, pattern search like lazy finite state machines. Uh, so you can do pattern search with predicates like, here are the predicates somewhere here, okay. Loop while any or abort. Uh, you know, loop while any or abort token string comparison, blah, blah, blah. So you can daisy chain if you know what regular expressions are. This is much better than regular expression for code analysis. So you can do pattern matching in the text files of a particular language grammar. And of course, languages are polymorphic. Um, so, for example, if we go to JSON, you will get a, an instance of the JSON, um, JSON language that will have basically a factory method for file, some file extensions, make lexer, make parser, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, that's a factory method that makes a lexer of a preferred particular language and you can do a lot of polymorphic stuff with different languages and so, okay so code analysis primarily is used for configuration parsing okay those are some collection helpers not not a, but bit listed bit matrix 2d that is used for uh, qr code generation enough about this data access that's a huge framework here right here i mean huge conceptually huge but it's not that large if you open it up here, that's all there is to it. And that for us completely supersedes uh, entity framework and other types of ORM or other types of working with the, with the data sources. Now, the way how this works, it's a hybrid model that is built around the, the schema, the row, typed row and dynamic rows that can shape themselves at runtime or typed rows can be just classes with the field attributes. The attributes, they have very rich model for um, here, they have a very rich model for stuff like 
key kind, you know, whether it's a telephone, a zip code, whatever, value list, all of that is also localizable. So you can even, you can even translate, automatically translate the enumerated types, descriptions and stuff like that. There is tons of stuff here. So this is, uh, this was a field attribute, which is used in the CRUD models, which are used throughout the system to build domain objects. You don't have to use it to work with your database, but that's one of the, one of the easiest ways uh, of doing things uh, here. The interfaces give you CRUD operations. So you're familiar with active record pattern. So this is like a CRUD data store that has insert, absurd, update, delete. Uh, then you can do multiple, load multiple, get schema, blah, blah, blah. Now this is very important concept of the queries. The queries are abstracted. Those are virtual queries. They, they are virtual. So basically those are just a list of parameters. That's, that's just a named bag of parameters. And what they do, every particular database provider resolves your query either into a script, a store procedure call, or in some code. So that is uh, decoupling of your uh, business logic 100% from your backing store. And if your particular backend doesn't know how to handle this query in terms of like doing a select statement, then you can write 25 select statements in code and inject that query for that particular provider, your code still remains the same very important concept for being database transparent and supporting such such data stores as uh, uh, Mongo, you know, document oriented, not only SQL databases, but also re relational databases and not only relational databases and even Erlang and stuff like that. So that is it. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, we have a concept of distributed IDs, which is uh, two to the 96 power, uh, monotonically increasing IDs. They are distributed, they are generated by authorities in the clusters. This is a very interesting concept because it gives you very good key distribution uh, and they can be stored for a long time. An ID has a 32-bit integer error and 64-bit integer monotonically increasing 60 bits uh, is the counter and four top four bits is the authority. So you can have 16 authorities in the cluster that give you this IDs and this ID is getting buffered and cached in blocks that throttle up to the uh, point where your process, the more IDs your process need, it will increase the block size to the certain point. So that deserves a different, a separate video just to talk about this. So enough about data access environment is the configuration. Okay, separate video about that, and I have done already some videos about it. Just go browse them uh, on my YouTube channel, Erlang. We support Erlang uh, native integration with all types in CLR. Uh, data access, we support Erlang. So, see, you can write your queries, just like I explained a few minutes ago, against SQL Server, and then say, you know what, now I have some queries I need to run against Erlang backend or some Mongo backend to integrate with some other systems, you can provide the same unified interface. So this will allow you to write queries against Erlang in .NET. And then if you don't like Erlang, so for example, one of our uh, use cases was a legacy system was written in Erlang and uh, we had to use Erlang and it was used via this. Then some of those queries were migrated to MySQL and uh, so we replaced the data store with a hybrid data store. Some queries were running against MySQL, some against Mnesia running on Erlang and that worked uh, you know, pretty well. And I think it still works in production. So anyhow, um, uh, what you have here also a subscription model for the event so you can get push notifications from the server and subscriptions and it's all here. Now, as far as uh, connection, okay, so Erlang, enough about that. So this is the whole OTP protocol implementation with the EPMD links, local ports, PEDs, and all of that stuff. For those of you who know what Erlang is and how it works, okay, financial. We have some important types like amount. I don't know why .NET doesn't have it, or maybe they have it in 4.6 framework, I don't know, but amount basically couples ISO currency, currency with a value, and all of the arithmetic is done using amounts, okay? 
uh, geometry, some important things like Cartesian utils, lat longs, good class, Haversine distance formula between two points and parsing, triparse, all of that stuff. Glue, that is the replacement for Windows Communication Foundation for us. I'm not saying that we're competing with WCF. We're absolutely not competing with WCF because we don't care about SOAP and all of that stuff. What we care about is tight interconnection in the cluster and being a very efficient. So on this machine, this machine can serve easily 150,000 two-way calls a second with contracts, with security, with everything, okay? So one-way calls, 300 to 400,000 easily. This server, this machine that I'm on right now can serve 400, uh, you know, one-way chat messages, 400,000, that is, messages uh, through the glue. The glue is a very similar approach to WCF. You create a contract, only here you don't really need to create a data contract. You just do an operation contract because glue is for a tight coupling of Unistack systems. It is not really usable for uh, connecting Erlang to, uh, let's say, or Erlang OTP to CLR process. That's not what glue is for. Glue is for gluing multiple instances of the process, sometimes even the same process, and migrating the object and state between the nodes and doing all kinds of cluster programming. Okay, that's what glue is. But it is similar in terms of contract-oriented uh, design. Okay, uh, that's okay. Instrumentation it has is something uh, like gauges and uh, um, you know like like performance counters basically but in the cluster environment those things work way better than windows stuff why because they get uh, map reduced uh, mapped and reduced between different zones of the cluster and then we get the uh, the total the totals and uh, we can see what the hell is going on in the zone of the cluster on a particular data center and we can visualize it in real time okay and this is very efficient so basically you create uh, a, a kind of um, a bunch of derivatives from the datum class and then you can say you can say your gauges so let's look at the base gauges here so you know what i'm talking about here like long gauge okay it's just gauge that the tracks long stuff somewhere here uh, somewhere here I have uh, operating system gauges was it here or yeah it was okay operating system okay CPU OS long gauge CPU usage RAM usage available RAM stuff like that very simple class that has some some here you know and and uh, map and reduce here is your reduce function basically make aggregate instance uh, that um, does a seed and then the framework does an emit of the same thing against the seed and then it collapses it reduces it uh, automatically okay so that deserves a video on its own about instrumentation inventorization uh, a way to categorize different assets and code N this concept never even you know really took off uh, we still have it some used in some old code let's not waste time on this for now uh, file system IO that's the best thing that we one of the best things we have here around in the in the NFX system because this is the virtual file system interface and for that we have a local file system implementation and then the same APIs are implemented in the web assembly where we have an implementation for Google Drive, Amazon S3 and SVN. So basically you can work with this file system. So this is where the local file system using the same APIs. So instead of doing file exists, you go connect to the file system and you fetch the file by name, by path, and it will give you the file and you see if file exists or it doesn't exist and all of that. Only now you are completely decoupled from the implementation. Your files can be in HDFS. We used to have HDFS, by the way, Hadoop file system, but we have not open sourced it yet. I don't have time. I don't have plans now to open it, but we did it with HDFS as well. Okay, so that tells you what the file system is. Very important piece of logic. Now, uh, here is a, a, another marvel of NFX, which is the gate. The gate is a stateful software side firewall. Wow, 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 wait a second. Why would you need a firewall in your software? So this is perfect for very intricate denial of service attacks, traffic filtration, and... Um, 
things like someone tries to charge your credit card or someone tries to abuse your credit card and make a purchase more than two purchases uh, you know in a minute or something like that it's a rule based firewall that you can put in your code that basically has a set of rules okay so it it transparently integrates in your web server actually it has nothing to do with the web server because it deals with traffic incoming traffic outgoing traffic i traffic is just an interface and then you have http inc incoming traffic is one way of uh and then there is a general traffic so you can basically use the state machine as a firewall for any kind of traffic glue traffic it can be a traffic on the forum site where people enter you know uh like bad words or something like like that you can ban people and, and send them the rest api you know access denied or something too many bad words or too many posts in one minute or something like this it's a state machine for network programming okay that's what it is okay um uh there are some very interesting things here like uh compressible uh lab one to eight you know big engines and stuff uh slim uh that's our format for encoding binary information into the streams okay that's fine uh not closing stream wrap some helper classes some of those things microsoft has now put a flag in the text reader and writer not to close the stream but this was done even before that existed okay uh so that's an io concept here uh log the whole logging framework no log for net no and log or any other framework so this is a unistack framework so we have everything here there are multiple syncs here that we use most of the time we use csv file destination console destination but you can create very complex logging graphs with slas so if your logging sync let's say is not working up to the up to the spec then it will fail over the traffic from that sync to a different sync okay so that that that's what logging does and i can talk about logging for another three hours okay media uh, what we have done, we have a very uh, basic implementation of PDF writer. Many times you need to create a receipts and PDFs and send it to customers and emails. So it's right here. It's right here. And it even does like text and styling and stuff. PDF colors and raw styles. It's not a full PDF. It's not as good as Migra doc or something, but it d gives you enough to uh to do a a good uh you know um a good looking pdf okay that's what it is so tag codes for the qr codes we have done some qr uh encoding routines that we've refactored from uh z uh, zebra or zilling or something like that apache thing and they're refer this guy's a reference here but most of this thing has been rewritten some of it has been rewritten from scratch per unistack as we already had some concept already in the framework so we use ours instead of theirs and um it's pretty good it's it's a it's a it's a good code base you know it does the um you know qr uh in, encryption encoding uh okay uh for the operating system we have uh information for um network utils okay so uh many readers one writer synchronizer so this is a very tight lap to my much performs much better than spin lock uh on um uh, for our purposes we needed it for pile and some memory management tasks so this is this was optimized basically something like spin lock but it has some uh, crazy numbers here it works a little bit better than uh, the one that Mark Rusinovich did and the one that is in the .NET so we did some uh, profiling on multi-core machines and arrived at you know this implementation here so parsing uh, that's that's just some utils to do uh, you know evaluator uh, a natural text generator is the class that generates natural names and different permutations between names and addresses and all of that fake information that looks that has very good statistical distribution okay you can look at this class natural text generator that is okay um, uh relational model that allows us to write a, a bunch of config files and script files to to compile different uh ddl uh, files for different um, uh, targets okay and we use extensively mysql right now and and some other uh, targets uh security so security here you have a user you have permissions you have roles you have all of that stuff it has nothing to do with active directory it is completely cluster oriented cluster minded uh, you know so you can take all of that stuff store it in your database store it in your security and integrate with social networks like facebook and stuff like that um, 
it is way more powerful than the security that you would have in your MVC, let's say, application, because it, it can be very, very granular and uh, declarative. And the permission, basically, it's an attribute. It's an attribute, and you can decorate different parts of the class interface constructor method field property, and you can do a lot of stuff. You can guard, you can see who can fail or whether you have it or not, and then you can fail authorization and authentication. But the, the crown of this design is the, the credentials model that are very you know uh, abs abstracted the bo the most um, simplest credentials id password credentials just plain text credentials but um, somewhere here you have um, uh, in the interface of security manager you have basically a few methods authenticate uh, with the token authenticate with credentials authenticate with the user and then uh, authorize is the method that is called from permission. So uh, this whole security concept here is like uh, doubly, um, doubly uh, virtual, uh, like a visitor pattern, you know, doubly. So it's virtual on both sides. So the permission is virtual, security manager is virtual, and they call each other. And that allows it to do a very, very flexible system. Uh, even in permission, you can put some imperative logic, like, so you say alcohol sales permission. You can also check if your customer is 21 years of age. Otherwise, the permission check is going to fail. So uh, CAPTCHA, uh, you have puzzle keypads, very cool class that allows you to do some uh, puzzles for CAPTCHA. It's built in here. CAPTCHA, that is complete uh, automated Turing test or some whatever, whatever the acronym is. You know, the robot check, that's what it is. Okay, serialization, we have full support for Basin because we do our own MongoDB driver. Yeah, that's right. We have our own MongoDB driver, which is uh, certified with uh, with our Mongo 3.2. It works very well. It works very fast. It is way faster than the official Mongo driver. And the official Mongo driver for C Sharp, they know about this driver, only they are more... Um, you know, they follow those standards. So this code base here is very, very small, but it is uh, way more efficient because there are some optimizations done here, how the documents and elements are allocated to cut down on the allocation uh, heap pressure, GC pressure. Okay, JSON. We have the full JSON stack to read and write JSON objects from different formats. What I don't do here, I don't write JSON back into any arbitrary class in .NET because in my whole career, I have never needed to write, to read, I beg your pardon, to read a JSON object into a complex CLR type. I don't know why people are so crazy about it. Um, it's just a wrong, wrong architecture to begin with. So it does read JSON objects to, to CLR types, but not to like concurrent dictionaries and stuff. If you need to read your JSON to concurrent dictionary, there's something wrong with your design altogether. There is something you are doing wrong. We can talk about it some other time, but basically it writes any class, anonymous types, lists, collections, dictionaries. It writes it to JSON and reads it back from JSON. JSON writing options and reading options, those are like different, uh, you know, whether you want ASCII encoding, pretty print, pretty print ASCII, rows and maps, maps as uh, complex type status. Do you want it as an array of fields or a map or field name, uh, you know, value, field name, value, all, all this kind of stuff. So a lot of a lot of stuff here in the JSON framework. Okay, let's keep this for now. This stands for portable object document. That's a binary format for moving binary data. Let's keep that for now. Slim. This is a very, this is a cornerstone. This is the very important uh, serialization format that we use for glue and other things. This is a blazingly fast teleporting serializer. Now, what is teleportation? Teleportation is an act of taking your class from here and just moving into the different process. How is this possible? Well, this is possible because it does pretty much the same stuff that binary formatter, only it produces way slimmer, way slimmer datagrams. It talks about it here. The serializer yields an average one four serialization and one one half deserialization time compared to binary formatter. Now, these are obsolete uh, benchmarks. I think we're now like twice faster than what the ones are stated here. And in terms of like uh, size, they are incomparable. Like if binary formatter makes a, a datagram uh, 300 kilobytes, the slim serializer can easily do two, two kilobytes. Okay, 150 times smaller. 
the way it does it does a lot of compression without using cpu cycles and there is a lot of crazy stuff look at the source code and then uh there is a project here there is a project here called uh sir uh serializer benchmarker bench sir bench right here where we have performed and you can run it and retry it yourself uh we have performed the head-to-head -head comparison between different serializers so this tool creates a a, um, a a set of tables okay that tell you different uh how different serializers perform and uh they just show you you know those how those things stack up together you know head-to-head -head comparison between different serializers okay good so um enough about that uh service model is just the way how you write your services okay service in terms of like if you have some thread that needs to spin for a long time not like task but like some service let's so let's say emailer or some someone who sends emails or so, something like demon or something like this so it's like a lightweight process so to speak it has a, a state it has a things like start stop it's a, like a lightweight like erlang process okay that's what it is so that's not a service as a network service. It can be service within your application. Templatization, okay. So you're familiar with Razor. Uh, this is not as, as elaborate as Razor in terms of parser, but is way more pliable than Razor because what this allows us to have is templatize any kind of content, including beat maps and whatnot. So, you know, like you can, you can have a, an audio file where you have a beep and instead of beep, you can synthesize the name of the person like dear, deet, thank you for purchasing toot. So now we can say dear Mr. Smith. Thank you for purchasing this. So the templatization engine is not necessarily text-based. Most of the cases it is. Uh, text C-sharp template compiler is the compiler that uses C-sharp as a primordial language for the templatization. Similar concept to Razor. And we use it for web. All of our web development is done using this stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have a plugin with the syntax highlighting for Visual Studio. Someone wants to take this task, very good i'm all for it i don't have time for it unfortunately and syntax coloring in visual studio is not something is not number one on my priority list okay throttling that is to slow things down and establish policies that this thing can do only x or y calls every z minutes or z seconds and there are a lot of different it's it's a very complex subject actually sliding window throttle and throttling uh, and time spacing throttle and there is some some interesting mathematics that this thing performs here and we have done um this with serge elenikov because uh, he he's used this for trading and some other high frequency trading and some other scenarios that he had to use throttling for time get time from uh good clocks inject your time source uh, have an event timer where you can schedule stuff okay let's look at the event you can schedule it uh, you know, you can schedule it once, once, once start date, end date, interval, max count, how many times it can run. Does it only run on Monday or on Tuesday, whatever. And all of that is, in, is injectable from config files. So you can basically create a scheduled daemons that you can schedule in config file and it all dependency injection puts it all together for you. This is a shortcut application uh, for the application instance. Okay. Yes, it's a static class. Yes, it's a purposeful design and it is done like this and it works very well and it is very well testable because in the test you can do a mock application. You inject it in your test picture and then all of your unit tests, they're all uh, injectable. But your code is very easy to read because you can just say app log write. Okay. No crap. No context. No nothing. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, there are some interesting things here. So first of all, external random generator is the generator with a cyclical buffer that does some steering from the outside. So you can feed an entropy sample to it, external entropy sample. And it has very interesting methods like next random web safe string that only use web safe pairs and stuff like that. Go check it out. Fid, uh, that is fast ID. This is instead of GUID. It is way faster than GUID. So it is like 57 times actually faster than GUID, at least on this machine and other machines. Uh, it uses some uh, thread safe time stamps and some crazy, oh, it doesn't use interlock increment because interlock increment is only used for seeds. Did you know that interlock increment actually puts the LCK prefix on your data bus and that really slows things down? So 
people think, oh, interlock increment is the fastest thing you can do. No, it is not. The fastest thing is to get a, a, a thread private or thread static variable and then a lot like uh, 16 bits in it or something like that and then increment that those inside the, the thread okay and this this talks about some mathematics here how many times this can wrap around and stuff so this fast id is good for for two weeks well actually 19 days but two weeks to be on the safe side of things so what is this id used for for things like identifiers which is 64 bits and they are guaranteed to be unique even when your process crashes and restarts internal id used for database logs for different kind of things for message identifiers in the network stack and all of that um pretty cool pretty cool okay so um what else do we have here electronic link you can change the link uh, uh you know you can change the 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 64 bits in the interesting uh looking things like mama labo mama mama or something like this it looks like much better than the garbage that uh link shorteners generate out there okay then um okay so that's that's pretty much it because oh 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 very interesting things very important things string value conversion allows you to take strings as different types with smart conversions okay this is very important for web programming i don't know how other people do it without without having this in their root namespace uh as type is a very interesting accessor because it takes a string value and it casts it to this type doing strict conversions uh or uh relaxed conversions in the strict mode you parse true is true false is false in the relaxed mode you parse yes is true one is true zero as false no as false etc etc okay you get the picture what this is this is very good for data migration and variant culture and stuff like that um object value conversion is a counterpart that takes an object now this is again it uses uh convert class sometimes but it does a lot of conversions that are not um so for example as but it, it also understands radixes of uh, binary and hexadecimal and stuff like that this is actually used in the config files route so any value like integer for example you can say zero x and then hexadecimal or zero b or octal number or something like this which is not which is not possible in microsoft configuration that sucks i don't know why they didn't do it this way but this is very very useful okay so enough about this nfx wave is our web framework i'm going to talk about it in a different video web some web protocols and stuff like email geo lookup max mine database for ip geolocation io uh, i talked about this already that's a file system for google drive s3 and svn uh, in the svn we store a lot of things about the cluster so that is very good you can uh, you know store it in the svn and you can get it from one one source of truth instead of uh, copying those files on every server pay is an abstraction of the payment framework we currently have paypal stripe and braintree we're working on and that is also pci compliant because what we're doing we're capturing that the, the uh, with the javascript library we're capturing the credit card details and they never land on your server instead you get a token from the processor and what we did we have completely abstracted this from the implementation of particular providers so you can swap paypal for stripe or braintree or whatever if you want to do that now uh, with the social networks we have the following social networks implemented facebook google plus um that is russian i don't know if we have anything no we haven't done anything about it um uh, but twitter of course twitter is our favorite uh, and uh what you can do with these things uh, it's an oauth2 uh plugins basically that you can you can uh, connect to the framework or to the network you can get a user identity and you can tweet and post pictures or whatever you can do you know with uh with uh with those guys okay so um and then winforms is a bunch of legacy stuff so pr that's pretty much it so here uh the, the last uh, the, the last con con concluding thoughts here in anifax you have pretty much everything that you need to write scalable uh 
web or client server or or different kind of distributed or single you know uh, just local systems whatever you want to write but the fact here the fact of the matter is uh, that you don't need once you start using all of the services many of the services interdependent on each other that's why in the same assembly and the reason for this being non PCL or p portable class library compatible is that we don't have, we don't need it to be PCL compatible. You guys, this is Apache 2.0 code. You can take parts of the framework out, but then you will need to rewrite some of the things if you need to write it, run it on Silverlight. We never had any Silverlight code. We never had any, um, you know, Xamarin code that we needed to integrate it with. Uh, it could be done, but for us, this is a server side framework that runs on Windows and it runs on Linux as well and here is one of the screenshots on my ubuntu ubuntu box and something got wrong here with latest mono installation something crashed here i didn't figure out what was that was but i have a test website running the whole whole stack built wave test site built in the mono develop on linux right here and i have it running on linux here uh, this was actually April, I think, April 2015. Now, I'm very excited about Microsoft, uh, uh, what is it called, DV, uh, D DNM or whatever, the .NET Runtime Manager. Uh, the new one, the new, uh, the new runtime, the RuJIT and all of those things, new compiler, JIT compiler that natively runs in Linux. So we can now run our software. We can package instead of solution, just package it as a JSON file and stuff. I haven't done it yet. I don't have time and we, we're swamped with other business projects at the moment, but we're uh, waiting for the Linux implementation to stabilize because this is actually pretty much that replaces much of the other stuff that you need from other third-party packages. And like I said, the benefit of NFX, once you have it, instead of having all of that stuff here, you just have this now because your application becomes much smaller. And one last, one last thing I want to show you here real quick. If I open this up and go to the output folder where it builds the output, the actual NFX DLL, uh, where is it? Okay, NFX DLL is 2.17, uh, 2.1 megabytes. Okay, and then uh, the Mongo driver is okay. It's laughable. 64 kilobytes. Um, the um, the wave the web uh, framework is 1.1 megabyte, and that includes a lot of binary resources. Includes all of the Java framework minified and all of that stuff. And this is 300 kilobytes. So all of that stuff together. All of that stuff together is way smaller than five megabytes, okay? And then there are some tools here, command line tools that like NFX template compiler that can compile those templates. Remember I talked about templatization. Glue compiler compiles the uh, clients for the servers transparently. And uh, there are some tools here, but you don't, you don't use them on the daily basis. Uh, and uh, so that's pretty much it. So once you know uh, how this stack uh, of software works, you can rely on it as we are not changing the way how, how everything works every you know five or six months like others do, and we don't have any packages to track because it's just one package. You, you, it's a unistack. It's the unified stack of software. It's not a library. It's not a framework. It's a stack of software, which is even bigger than the framework. Okay. So in the next video, I'll cover more topics and the more, um, um, more details, but that, that has been the NFX crash course, uh, video number one. Thank you.